Questions to the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development. Questions four and six of the list of questions have been withdrawn. So I call Sandra Overend. Question number one, please. The intention to procure an ICT system to replace the IFAS was notified in the official journal of the European Union in the first week of July 2014. The value of the contract was given as 56 million, from 56 million up to 65 million, excluding VAT, over an anticipated lifetime um, of 15 years. This value was based on the projections and the estimates employed in the outline business case. It includes the costs of NIFAS's initial development and testing and support for the migration of data and transitioning from DARD's existing systems. This anticipated cost also covers the system's support and maintenance over its 15-year lifetime and any further development, enhancement or upgrade that may be required within that period. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give a commitment um, that as her department enters into a budgetary cycle, which she herself admits uh, is immensely difficult, uh, she will review her decision to spend so much money on the new system and in particular revisit it to determine if there are any areas which cost savings could be made? I can assure the member that the department have done its homework in terms of the outline business case and making sure we cost the system fully and that's all been done and it's fed into um, the estimate that's been set out in the journal. But you have to remember what this system does. This system gives us quality assurance. This system allows us to stand above others in terms of going into other export markets, targeting new markets because we can say we're fully traceable, we have a system that stands over that. So that's the value of the system and I think on the scale of things it does sound like a considerable amount of funding, 56 to 65 million. But you have to remember that's also over 15 years and it is the ongoing maintenance and it is also um, will be able to respond to any change in needs that the industry may have. So I, I think it will be um, a well worth investment that the industry requires and we require if we're going to be successful in achieving the aims that have been set out and going for growth which are around target new markets. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her comments on NIFAS. Can the Minister assure the House that a project team is in place and it will be effective in bringing in a cost-effective system within an agreed time scale that meets the needs of the farming community. Yes, I can assure again assure the member that um, we're doing everything that we can. This system is so important to the industry. Um, it records all the data, it records all the information, so it's so important that as we work our way through the process, and this has been some time in the making to get us to the stage now where we're out for tender, um, it's so important that the system's right, that it's appropriate, that it fits the needs of the industry, and that's certainly what the project board are um, establishing and working up as we speak. I call Declan McLean. Carmen Algott. Uh, could the Minister elaborate on the necessity for such an ICT traceability system, Carmen Algott? Yes, again, you know, and I've made this point on a number of occasions, but I do think it's important that we do um, make it. What we're talking about here is somewhere between about 3.7 million and 4.5 million per year over 15 years, which gives us full traceability for the industry, which allows us to target new markets, which allows us um, to, to really showcase what we have to offer to say that we've got full traceability. And the member will, will um, be acutely aware that over the recent um, horse meat issue, our industry was able to stand above others because we had full traceability system. So that's the value of, of this system and why we need to procure to make sure that we have a new system that's in place that will help our vet service but also help the industry in terms of the traceability. And it helps us in terms of said, the vet service around the TB work and everything else that, that happens. So it, it's a necessity for the department. Um, we're making sure and the project board is making sure that we have um, uh, crossed all our T's, dotted all our I's in terms of making sure that we're getting absolute value for money, that the system is able to respond to the needs of the industry and I'm confident that that's what we're going to have. I call Stephen Mutry. Number two, Deputy Speaker. <coughs> The Forest Service has used funding made available through the Executive's Economy and Jobs Initiative to make the listed building known as the Tullymore Tea House compliant with modern requirement for public access and fire safety. That work is complete and the building is at the stage where it can be made available for operation and fitting out by a franchisee or developed for an alternative use. The Forest Service is working in partnership with Down District Council on the Council's plans for the overall development of Tullymore Forest Park and officials attended a presentation of the consultant's advice to the Council shortly before Christmas. Forest Service was informed that the Council anticipates a need to provide catering facilities. Details for further involvement by the Council or a franchisee have still to be developed. Efforts to find a franchisee, a franchisee um, continue some 
for some time after the previous tenant left in 2002 without success. The chief reason for it is believed to be the high costs of operating the building and the difficulty for someone in making an adequate financial return. Since then, the Forest Service has offered a mobile catering franchise to meet summer demand and tenders for the 2015 season are invited by the 23rd of January this year. I call Stephen Mitry for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her response. Tullymore Forest Park is one of the most utilised outdoor forest parks in Northern Ireland. Can I ask the Minister, will she do everything she can to see that there is some food provision for this summer, given the numbers of tourists that visit not only locally but also from international? Yes, and I agree with you, and I agree with the potential for the forest. Um, as I said, officials are continuing to work with the Council in terms of making sure that we at least have the, the current arrangement in place for the summer of this year, but we're obviously more keen that we get a, a sustainable longer-term solution, and we're actively working with the Council to do that. I call Sean Rogers. Thanks, Minister, for your answer thus far. Minister, will the Department give an assurance that it will consult and cooperate with the councils before making any forestry franchises, particularly that the councils have spent quite a bit of money in, in putting business cases forward for such facilities. Yes, absolutely. The development at the forest has been in conjunction with um, the council, and as I said, officials attended those, that meeting just before Christmas with the council officials. So we're very keen to make sure we work with our partners. Key to the departments and to the Forest Service social and recreational use of forest is that community partnership. Is that. Um, partnership with council. So for me, it's vital that that's the only way that we can take these projects forward if they're going to be successful. Moving on, I call Raymond McCartney. Yes, number three. Question number three, please. I'm pleased to report that 40 events have now been held across the rural north to encourage rural dwellers to join the new local action groups. It's encouraging that over 2,000 people have ex expressed an interest in being a social partner on the new lags and indeed have completed a membership form. 600 people have indicated further that they would prefer to sit on a lag, board, be a, a lag board member, and others have expressed an interest in being involved in the day-to-day -day work of the lag, such as sitting on assessment panels. This is great progress, and I believe these figures show that there's a clear evidence of the interest out there in rural communities for people to have their say in how funding is invested in their rural area. The lag process will continue with lag boards being selected by the end of January, and I look forward to the, the new lags and their contracts being awarded as soon as um, as the operational programme is approved by the European Commission. I call Raymond McCartney. I call Raymond McCartney. I Can I thank the Minister for her, her answer? Uh, she, she said at the end that she was waiting for I think, some sort of clearance from the European process, but has she any indication of when the actual application bids will open? Yes, the operational programme is with the Commission. We had initially hoped to have um, some initial uh, conversation with them or confirmation uh, of, um, of their views on the programme. That hasn't happened yet, but we're still um, aiming towards um, June time to be able to hopefully get um, things out, um, get things officially signed off. However, in the absence of that, what we're going to do is um, develop the local um, programmes, the local leader programmes will be delivered by these new local action groups, so they can be working on that. And we actually hope to open for um, what's called animation, basically open and ask for expressions of interest of, for new projects coming forward in, um, towards the end of April, um, start of May 2015. I call Robin Swan. For answer in regard to members, can the Minister give an update on how LAG staff members will be transferred between the old LAGs and the new LAGs? I um, can give the member more detail on writing. I don't have that detail here, but suffice to say, we're working with the councils because obviously um, they were the employers of, of the staff. So that's all a process that's been worked through at this moment in time, but I'm happy to provide the member with more detail on writing. Call Kieran McCarthy. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response so far. Could the Minister advise the Assembly um, on the suitable social partners, and would that include conservation groups? Uh, who already do excellent work throughout Northern Ireland? Yes, absolutely. We're, we're really keen that we get as many um, views around the table as possible. That's why we've actually went out and really um, run very hard in terms of trying to reach new people that maybe don't necessarily have been involved in, in lag structure in the past. So I think, given the numbers that have come forward, there's, there's certainly, from a quick look through the, through the list, there's certainly quite a wide range of, of people to consider or including conservation groups. I call William Irwin. Can I ask the Minister, is the Minister confident that the time frame of June can be met for the opening of new applications? 
Yes, well, we're certainly um, not sitting back and waiting on Europe to confirm the programme. Obviously, it's with them, and we, and we hope to get approval ASAP. But there's a lot of work that we can do, the animation work on the ground, asking for applications, getting things started. So, yeah, I'm pretty confident that by about May time, we should be able to actually have applications sitting on the desks. Move on. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question five, Minister. I am committed to supporting beef and sheep farmers in our LFAs and have ensured that there is a range of support measures available to support the sustainability of these farms. In January 2014, I agreed to a further less favoured area compensatory scheme for 2014-15, providing stability to beef and sheep farmers in these areas during this transition period to the new CAP support framework. I have announced this morning that payment rates under the scheme will remain unchanged from previous years and I expect payments to issue from early March. Direct support under Pillar 1 of the CAP is vital to our farming industry and currently around 160 million goes to farm businesses located in the LFAs. Implementation of CAP reform this year will bring changes for many farmers, but the overall level of direct support going to LFAs and particularly the severely disadvantaged area will increase slightly year on year. The new Rural Development Programme will provide opportunities to join a new agri-environment scheme, help facilitate integration and cooperation in supply chains, and provide training, advice and support to help improve efficiency. The proposed Farm Business Improvement Scheme will include a portfolio of measures to support sustainable growth in all farming sectors. In June 2014, I announced the new ANC scheme for the first two years of the next RDP period. This replaces the current LAFACA scheme. I intend to implement a one-year transitional payment for farmers in the disadvantaged areas, as these, will, these areas will no longer be eligible for this support under new EU rules. I will not change the current LFA boundaries in the short term. The redesignation of these boundaries can be considered in tandem with the review of the ANC scheme, which is planned to commence later this year. I call Dolores Kelly. Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for her very uh, detailed answer. Uh, Minister, in relation to uh, the advice and guidance being given to the farmers, what exact, exactly the will the shape of that be? Particularly given the, the period of change that we're going through because of cap reform and everything's changing for farmers in terms of their support, their single farm payment being split into three payments, all the changes are in green, and so there's quite a considerable body of information coming um, towards farmers. So we're, actually, we're out on roadshows in terms of trying to give people information in person. Um, there's a question and answer on the DARD website. We have a DARD helpline, and I encourage farmers who are in any doubt on any issue to, to seek um, advice and guidance. We also, through our CAFRI advisors, have people who assist um, farmers in terms of their business development and, and how um, they take their business forward. So there's a lot of advice through CAFRI also. So I, as again, I encourage farmers to, to take those opportunities. I call Ian Milne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, our Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for answer thus far. Uh, how can the Minister support low and volatile incomes uh, on LFA beef and sheep farms? I, I recognise that LFA beef and sheep farmers operate in what is um, obviously by nature of geography a very challenging economic environment and farm gate prices are not as high as farmers would like. Input costs have increased in recent years, exchange rates are volatile and the current weakness in the euro all impacts on returns from exports and reduces the value of single farm payments. I have worked hard to ensure a fair deal for LFA farmers under cap reform that will come into effect this year. The new RDP also contains much that will benefit LFA farmers. I have also continued the LAFACA payment into 2015 and maintained the level of payment per hectare. Overall, my department is delivering a package of measures that will improve and sustain LFA beef and sheep farmers. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal De or Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can, I, can I ask the Minister to clarify how many farms receive less favoured area support in 2014-2015 and will no longer be eligible to receive such support? And can she provide an update on the estimated value of the one-year transitionary payment? Yeah, the, there's approximately 17,000 farm businesses that are currently in the LFA scheme. In terms of the numbers who are going to lose out, and remember, they're losing out as a, as a result of an EU change, not as a, as a department change. So, um, the, Europe has said that um, next year there will no longer be a payment that will be paid to disadvantaged areas. In terms of the numbers, I don't have that figure to hand, but suffice to say, I was very concerned that these are going to be people who are going to miss out on a payment, who no longer will receive that um, payment. So I secured agreement with the executive for the transitional payment. But um, 
It's, it's no bother to send the member um, on the number of farmers who are going to be impacted upon, and the rate will be struck then accordingly, um, same time as yours we do every time. Moving on, I call Danny Kinnan. Question number seven, please, Dr. Speaker. The position on agricultural property relief was outlined in a letter from the British Treasury to the then um, Ministers of Agriculture and Rural Development and Finance and Personnel in December 2009, and that position remains unchanged. It clarifies that land let in Connacher will qualify for agricultural property relief, provided that the deceased owned the land throughout the period of seven years immediately prior to death, and throughout that period the land was farmed either by the deceased or by another person. Although all taxes are kept under review, I'm not aware of any plans to change the rules around agricultural property relief, and in particular how it relates to Connacher land. As taxation law is complex and liability depends on individual circumstances, it's important that professional advice is sought for specific cases. I call Danny Kennan for supplementary. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. And I think I have to declare an interest in I let land out on, on Conacre. Um, but I'm still very concerned that those who have uh, done so may find themselves in the future, because of the change in the definition of what is an active farmer, has the Minister and is she taking advice from HMRC about the future to ensure that farmers are protected and they don't find that their future is changed and they can't hand their farms on to the next member? The assessment by DARD as to whether a business is eligible um, for a particular scheme under the Common Agriculture Policy is not the determinant factor whenever it comes to um, taxation liability. But I, I can assure the member that um, throughout um, all of, 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 we go through all the changes in cap reform that our um, department are working very closely with the ESO in terms of making sure that any legal um, aspects that may arise, that they're fully explored. These are the types of questions that we are being asked from farmers. So we're wanting to try and provide as much clarity as possible. Um, as I said, the Treasury has made it, hasn't made any changes. The British Treasury hasn't made any changes in terms of, of the scheme that they currently have on their books. And they've made it very clear that under current rules, land, Latin Conacher can qualify for agricultural property relief provided it has been owned by the deceased and farmed, including by another person, throughout the period of seven years immediately prior to death. But it is an area, I suppose, specific and very, very detailed area, but um, I can give assurance that we are working with department solicitors in terms of making sure that we clarify any of these issues. I call Mickey Brady. Graham, I got the last concordia, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far, and I think she's probably covered some of the answer to this question, and that is, what is the importance of being classified as an active farmer? Graham, I got Yes, and that, that's the question that comes up time and time again when it's in relation to this topic or other top, topics where people are um, seeking clarity around what is an active farmer. I think we've worked very hard in terms of trying to provide that detail for people. Unfortunately, Europe were a bit slow in terms of um, filtering out the information, but I do um, encourage um, any farmer who is in any doubt at all to contact um, the DARD direct offices, to contact um, Orchard House, to contact the department in any way. Use the question and answer on the website. Um, use the intranet. Um, use all the avenues that are there to make sure you clarify that you are indeed an active farmer because the purpose of cap reform is that we weed out the inactive farmer and make sure that supports go to those farmers that are um, actually farming the land. Moving on, I call Claire Subton. Uh, thank you. Uh, question number eight, please. The Farm Management Deposit Scheme, which operates in Australia, is one of a number of mechanisms that can assist farmers to deal with fluctuations in their annual farm income. The deposit scheme allows farmers to set aside pre-tax income in years of high income and then to draw on these deposits in years of low income with tax being paid in the year in which the money is withdrawn. This type of system could be beneficial for farmers. However, taxation policy is not a devolved matter and the introduction of such a scheme here is not within my gift. Our own tax system permits farmers to average profits over a two-year period, which allows farmers to spread their tax burden. I would support the extent, and, extent and the number of years over which this averaging can take place, but again, it's not a devolved matter. Fluctuating markets is not a new problem, but it remains a very difficult issue for farmers, and for me, it's one of the reasons that direct payments, such as the single farm payment, are so important to the agricultural industry, as these funds provide a regular income stream, the value of which is reasonably well known in advance. I fought hard to maintain the system of direct payments in the recent reform of CAP, and will continue to do so going forward. I call Claire Sutton for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Um, she spoke briefly earlier about departmental assistance concerning um, helping farmers with their income. So does the Minister acknowledge the, 
the current absence of a specific mechanism uh, designed to mitigate against price volatility? Um, um, Obviously, pricing is a commercial issue, so in terms of the department and what we can do to assist the industry, there's a whole range of issues, particularly around knowledge transfer, around um, providing advice, helping people work up business plans, um, around efficiency and, and promoting good efficiency on farm. So I think in terms of what I can do and what the department can do, we will concentrate on those areas. The other key area which we have to concentrate on, and that's at an executive level, not just for my own department, but also through Daddy, is the new markets, because we need to explore new markets for the industry. That will, again, um, help the price just for simple um, supply and demand um, in terms of when it comes to price. So these are the areas that we're focusing on in the department, but in terms of your initial question around um, being able to spread the, the um, farm deposit scheme across a number of years, I'd be very supportive of that, and I've actually written to DEFRA to, to raise that point. I call George Robinson. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as the trend is towards continuing growth and expansion opportunities for our farming communities, would the Minister agree it is important to assist our farmers through these difficult financial times? Absolutely, and we've seen um, the prices in the dairy industry and earlier, or the end of last year, the prices in the beef sector. Thankfully, they have improved, but it's a very, very challenging situation. We have had rising input costs, as I said earlier in, in one of the previous answers. All the challenges that are there, the value of the euro, um, all, all these things seem to be conspiring against the farming industry at this moment in time. So it's so important that my department does all it can to help people through what are very difficult times. One of the things that I did recently was actually have a meeting with all the main banks around flexibility, around dealing with their farming customers, just given the pricing situation that, that we're facing at this moment in time. That was quite a positive engagement. Um, I was accompanied by the UEFU, which again um, was quite positive that we were speaking with one voice in terms of asking the banks for a bit more flexibility for the industry as they go through what is a very difficult time. I call Sean Lynch. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm going to break a Sean. Uh, I know the Minister mentioned the dairy sector just in her last uh, answer. She knows it's a difficult uh, time for them. What support can DARD provide to this sector this time? Um, yeah, as I said, both um, I and my department are fully supportive of the dairy industry and, and we will continue to do um, what we can through uh, this difficult time. One of the, the recent issues of the introduction of the Russian ban on um, dairy imports um, both myself and the Deputy Minister wrote to the DEFRA Secretary of State advising um, of our concerns around, um, that were expressed by the, the local industry, particularly around the ban, and we emphasised the need for support from EU level. Um, that was something, again, that I um, raised also with Commissioner Chullis whenever I uh, was in Brussels in September. Um, again, with, with, um, I, I continue to lobby DEFRA in terms of their approach to Europe. We have very different views in terms of supports for the industry. However, I will still um, always fight the corner for, for our, our, our industry. As I said earlier, um, I've recently met alongside the UFU with the banks to discuss cash flow concerns. And um, as a follow-up to that, um, we, we um, had that discussion, as I said, with, with the banks, and, we, and it was a very useful conversation. Um, we have asked them to be very proactive, to be sympathetic, to be flexible, to work with the industry. And we're hopeful that that will be the case and that will be the experience of farmers. As I said, the drops in prices, the Russian ban, the EU, or the, um, I, the, the, in terms of all the challenges that are there for the industry, it's so important that um, I'll continue to do whatever I can. And alongside all the supports that we do provide, and particularly around the advice, as I said earlier, we need to be looking at new markets and what support we can um, provide for industry to get into those new markets. How can we target them? What do we have to offer? What's our unique selling point? And those are areas which I'm very keen to work with Daddy on in, in terms of um, living up to the aspirations of the Going for Growth strategy. Moving on, I call Alex Maskey. Yes, you're in the uh, whole question number nine, please. My department recognises the further development of renewable energy as a key commitment in the 2011-15 programme for government. In 2010, this executive approved the strategy, strategic energy framework, committing that by the end of 2020, 40% of electricity will come from renewable sources. My department and Forest Service, in particular, play, um, in particular, is actively investigating the opportunities to support these commitments and obtain value for money. Work from 2009 onwards confirmed commercial interest in the Forest Service estate. A wind energy development manager, seconded from the Strategic Investment Board since the start of 2014, is progressing work on um, site selection and assessment, commercial analysis, policy development and community participation and benefits. 
This is a large and complex piece of work looking at multiple sites. The business case must be robust and it must pass the tests of the approval process. I am pleased to report that a strategic outline case to support this work was approved in November 2014 and the next stages of business case development are ongoing. The Department's business plan requires Forest Service to publish a procurement strategy for the exploitation of wind farm development opportunities on its estate. In the first half of 2015, we intend to offer selected sites for the market to take forward. These sites are on forest land adjacent to operational, consented or wind farms under development and offer the best potential to deliver projects in a reasonable timescale. In parallel, we intend to um, further assess sites on forestry land that offer significant larger scale wind energy potential. I am committed to ensuring this work is done in consultation and in collaboration with local communities and representatives and making sure that all stakeholders benefit equitably so that the Forest Service projects become an exemplar for schemes that provide community participation and benefits from wind farms. Ask Colin Kula, could I first of all thank the Minister for that very comprehensive reply. Could I ask the Minister, does you have any plans or can she give any consideration to uh, giving uh, if you like, community benefits uh, resulting from such uh, developments on the Department's estate? Yes, I mean, in parallel with um, public acceptance, the theme of community um, benefits and participation is absolutely central to the process that I am interested in taking forward. It is a specific work stream. Um, of the wind development plans that Forest Service are taking forward to review and report on what community participation and benefits models exist in Ireland and other relevant jurisdictions, to stress test these models and their suitability for deployment on publicly owned sites, i.e. Forest Service lands, to present this information to community stakeholders in advance of wind farms plans um, coming forward. So that is key that we actually do that community involvement from the initial stages and that they are very much part of it. As I said, it is essential to the successful um, exploitation of opportunities on the force um, estate to ensure that all stakeholders benefit equitably. In particular, this means early and appropriate engagement with community stakeholders to ensure that whatever schemes are proposed for community participation and benefits are understood and considered acceptable. This may require Forest Service showing leadership in this area and potentially in advance of the work that is being taken forward by DADI, because DADI are also in, in the process of currently developing an action plan. Um, my department actually works with that, but in, in, in waiting for that to come forward, it's so important that the community benefits and participation are, are key to any, any projects that move forward. I call Patsy McGlone. I'll ask you on Gwaig's Mawiha, Slash and Ira Kamayas, and Pragrish Kimsey, actually. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her comprehensive answers there. Um, in light of the collapse of the wind turbine at Fintna, <clears throat> could the Minister provide us with some detail as to what health and safety construction and location guidelines would in fact be used by the department, by her department, uh, with the construction of these, these turbines on de departmental lands? Yes, um, I watched very closely and, and talked to some of the residents in that area. Um, it was quite, I believe it's quite an unusual event what happened. That's not to say that there shouldn't be, there needs to be a full investigation into the ins and outs and what happened and, and, and why it went wrong. And I believe that that's an investigation that's underway and we look forward to, to the outcome of that. But absolutely central to any project that will be going forward under Forest Service land will obviously have to be health and safety concerns that will all be in, built into the pro programme and the planning going forward. And I can assure the member that they will be of the highest um, standards in terms of the health and safety um, asks which we will be requiring in terms of um, anything that goes on to Forest Service land. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's along the same lines, and it's just exactly what uh, consideration the Minister and her department will be given to the safety issues. If any new one farms that are going on the um, proposed um, grounds belonging to the department, and it'll be the same answer in terms of um, they'll have to be um, key to any project going forward. They'll be all inbuilt. I call Pat Ramsey. Question to the Deputy Speaker. The draft budget for DARD envisages that we would reduce our staffing by around 300 posts by the end of September 2015. For the second half of 15-16, that would affect a saving of 5.6 million and then an annual saving of around 11.2 million thereafter. We anticipate staff leaving the department under the voluntary exit scheme from the autumn of 2015. The 300 posts will be spread widely across the functions of the department, but it is not yet possible to be precise about which posts or functions will be affected. However, my priority will be to continue delivering services to our customers in the most efficient and professional way, but this may mean changes to the services and how we deliver them. 
My officials have already commenced a number of reviews of the department structures and operating models to identify where the reductions will come from and how services will need to change. The department is committed to a review of advisory services and the development of our customer contact model. We are also exploring the greater use of technology, of new technologies and digital services to achieve further savings. It is not yet possible to estimate the number of DART st staff that may avail of the civil service um, voluntary exit scheme, but we will be using other opportunities to achieve staff savings such as natural turnover through retirements, resignations and other levers. The department is also participating in the civil service wide embargo on recruitment and promotion and reviewing the use of agency and casual contracts. And that is the end of our period for listed questions, and we now turn to topical questions. And I call Martin Mulder. Mila Buihis, Alas Khan Korea. Boil him cash to current era. Major lesson agree we act. Hunsley act against Hushgar Aaron. I got a hunt her her armory. I wonder could I ask the minister what steps she has taken to minimise the impact, negative impact on farmers of the recent uh, NI water industrial action. Yet yeah, the. The situation is very unfortunate, I suppose, to say the least, as well as the, the risk to individuals and to homes, water supplies, vulnerable groups. It has the potential to affect farm animals. Farm animals also rely on fresh drinking water, and farmers also need clean water supplies for um, dairy hygiene purposes. My officials are working closely with NI Water to find ways to minimise any disruption. Farmers that are experiencing significant water shor shortages um, during the current industrial actions should, take, should contact NI Water in the first instance. Um, but also advice on water requirements and dairy hygiene. That's also been available on the DARD website, but I encourage farmers who are experiencing any animal welfare problems to contact our DARD helpline, which is 0300 200 7852. She plugged the hotline there. I wonder, could, she, could the minister tell us how many calls have been made to the emergency hotline in that regard? Yes, just, I suppose I should have added that um, we are working very closely with DRD and um, there is a multi-agency teleconference which happens um, daily, which the department is, is um, involved with. The, the, the helpline has actually only received two calls from farmers in Fermanagh and veterinary service are going to follow those up. Um, they are more um, seeking advice about the potential, um, however long this, would, this strike would last. So there are concerns and, as I said, I would encourage farmers to contact that helpline if they need any support. And I now call Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, you will be aware that following a two-year campaign by the Southern Government, Irish beef is now back in the U.S. menu after a 16-year ban. Can I ask what you and your department are doing to get the, um, an opening in the same market for the beef sector here in Northern Ireland? Yes, and, and core to the work that we're, we did around going for growth and the strategy that's been set out is the fact that we need to be targeting new markets. We're also um, working very closely with DETI in terms of Invest and, and the work that they do around the world in terms of targeting these new markets. And if we're back to the problems we talked about earlier around the, the difficulties that are facing farmers, that unless we find new markets, um, prices are con going to continue to be low. So it's so important that we do that. We've had some opening in new markets actually over recent months, um, South Africa being one. Um, and we will hope to also get into the American market and we'll be working to make sure we do that. We're a small island. What we offer has got full traceability. Um, we're working very closely with the, the department in the 26 counties in terms of making sure that we've got full traceability right across the island. When we achieve that, there's no reason why when export markets open up for the 26 counties that they also open up for us. Um, so I'm very keen to make sure that we explore all those new markets and to work with Daddy in terms of making sure that that's what we do for the industry. Call Thomas Buchanan for supplementary. Yeah, Minister, you're right. New markets are vital for the beef sector here in Northern Ireland. Uh, have we any indication when that sector will be able to enjoy and see the um, opening up of these new markets coming to fruition? No, we don't have an indication at this stage. I mean, it's very difficult. To, you know, for some time we've been um, chasing um, the Chinese market in terms of pork exports, and we've come so close. We're waiting on, a, on another um, veterinary inspection, and we hope to have that very soon. And we're pushing very hard for that. There, those are the, the, in terms of my department's role in, in, in terms of the export certificates, we're working very hard to prioritise the markets that the industry are targeting. So China is obviously a big market which, which we're exploring and, and I've been there on a number of occasions and will continue to do that until we break into that market for pork and then obviously all, all the other product that will come after that. And I call Gregory Campbell. Deputy Speaker, uh, when uh, would the Minister expect to be in a position to announce the rollout of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme? 
Will the member be aware as part of the draft consultation that I've set out that um, over the next year, in the 15-16 year, we're going to work very closely with farmers. We've set aside a draft allocation of funding to actually do the work with farmers on developing their business cases and getting them ready to be able to bid in. We've also set aside some money for the actual physical delivery on the scheme. So um, we're talking at this moment in time somewhere around about £3 million. However, that's um, the draft budget position. I'm hoping that maybe we'll be able to increase that as part of the consultation that I've been having with DFP um, and executive colleagues. So it's my intention that that will be rolled out before the end of the year. Call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, obviously, uh, things are pretty difficult in many sections of the agricultural community. Um, would she be able to identify which sectors are most likely to be able to benefit from uh, the scheme whenever it is announced? The scheme is not prescriptive in that it's not favouring one sector over the other. The whole industry, um, whether you be in the poultry sector, if you're in the dairy sector, or beef sector, or indeed um, horticulture, all the other many sectors that they are, they're all very keen to be able to develop their business. They all have business plans. So I think we don't all have business plans, but they all have business um, improvements in mind. So it's important that the department does the work with the industry, develop their business plans, and then be able to take forward, help them to make informed choices around how they're going to invest their own money and also apply for public funds. And I call Mickey Brady. My God, uh, can call you. Uh, how has the Minister acted to protect our priorities in terms of the 15-16 budget? Um, well, I suppose it, can I start, as I always do when it comes to budget discussions, around um, reinforcing our dismay at the um, extent of the Tory cuts to fund public services here and the challenging position that it puts all of us in. The scale of reductions are unprecedented, and particularly when it comes to my own department, trying to find 29.9 million resources, quite a challenging um, task. That being said, I've tried to take a very balanced approach, and we've tried to um, bring for, address the challenges that lie ahead. I'm resolved to deliver the commitments that um, were assigned to DART in the programme for government, as well as my key policy objectives, particularly around going for growth, around TRIPC, ANC, the leader approach, DART HQ, and flood alleviation. These are key areas for me, and what I've set out uh, in the draft bu budget position, these are the areas which I um, feel that we need to focus on. Um, to protect the funding for um, the key priorities, I've considered all elements of the DARD budget, and that review included the scrutiny of operational and running costs of DARD, as well as opportunities to leverage in additional sources of income. The draft budget proposals include six million of additional income that will help deliver a balanced budget. In addition to the savings plans, I'm also resolved to seek and secure um, additional funding to deliver the equipments made by the executive back in June of this year, and that includes funding to support the new rural development programme and going for growth in particular. And I'm aware that the Finance Minister um, has previously in the House ha expressed words of support in relation to going for growth, and we now need to see that translated into a financial commitment. I call Mickey Brady again. Thank the Minister for her answer. The Minister has acted to protect the TRPSA programme. Can the Minister outline what is allocated from that programme in 15-16? Yeah, rural poverty and social isolation programme is, um, I'm glad to say, is in course to meet its full um, spend allocation, which we had allocated up until this year. And the proposal to extend the programme until an additional budget year um, provides more funding to tackle the key issues of rural poverty and isolation. It's been um, seen very much so in terms of um, reviewing the responses to the DAR draft budget. It's been seen as a positive development by DARD stakeholders and partners. The resource allocation allows DARD to continue to support all existing schemes at the required levels in 15-16, and that includes um, the great projects such as MARA, um, the Arts Connect in Adelaide, Rural Isolated, Farm Family Health Checks, and Young Entrepreneur um, Projects. We're also able to do some more work in terms of improvement for broadband in rural areas. We're going to be able to open up a Rural Challenge program, providing community and voluntary groups with access to small-scale capital funding. So there's quite positive work being done um, through that program of about 4.7 million for the 15-16 year, and then obviously we'll be planning for the future around um, the, the schemes 15-16 um, on onwards. I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, the plight of the dairy farmer has been well highlighted over the past two or three months. Is there anything that the Minister or the Department can do to, to ease this pressure on the farmers? Yes, I mean, absolutely right. It's been such a dire situation for the dairy farmers, and we've been working very closely with the sector. As I said earlier, I've actually met with the banks recently just to ask them for flexibility 
for support for the industry, for sympathy for the industry in terms of the fact that their income is, is so reduced. So um, it's so important that um, we continue to drive home the message that farmers need to get a fair return for their product and that's um, the key message which I, I'll continue to, to, um, to drive home. The other areas of support, which, um, as I said earlier in, in previous answers, we work very hard with the industry around um, making sure that we knowledge transfer, that we're uh, um, providing support around efficiency, around education and training, around technical support, around AFB research programmes. Um, there will be opportunities for support for the industry under the new rural development programme. So there's quite a, a, a number of areas um, of work that, that we're um, targeting, that alongside um, the work that we're doing around targeting new markets. I call Adrian McCullen for supplementary. Yeah, thank the Minister for her answer. And my supplementary answer, her question was, could you meet the banks? But you already said you've met the banks, but did you get a fair hearing at that meeting? Yes, I did. I, did. I met the, the banks with the UFU, and I, I, um, it was all the leaders of the main banks, and I, we did get a fair hearing. Um, they understood the, the call that we made around flexibility and around um, support for the industry. Um, how that translates on the ground will obviously be evident and farmers will know that for themselves, but I'll continue to put um, political pressure where I possibly can on those people that can assist the, the industry at this, at this moment in time, and banks are obviously key. I call Katrina Ruan. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I wonder, could the Minister give me an update on the decentralised programme to Down, Derry, Tyrone and Fermanagh? I can. Um, I remain committed, obviously, to taking forward the, um, all reasonable steps to make sure we affect the transition of, um, of the Belfast-based headquarters to one in Ballykelly, the relocation of fisheries into South Down, forestry into Enniskillen, and Rivers Agency into um, Lockery Campus in Cookstown. And we're on target to deliver on the dates that we had originally set out. So later this year, we'll see the first of, of those moves being completed with forest service and fisheries. So I'm delighted that that's, that's ongoing. Um, it's, been, it's a considerable um, piece of work. The member will know that I'm very committed to the relocation programme. It is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs and it is about fairness across the public sector. So we'll continue to drive forward with that. And I have set out um, my commitment to that in terms of the draft budget position around the capital allocations. I'd like to thank the Minister for that and particularly welcome the decentralisation to my own constituency uh, and that it's on target. Um, and I wonder, could the Minister provide an update on staff surveys which have been carried out to identify interest in re relocating to the new areas? Yes, um, surveys have been completed now for all four locations in order to gather more detailed information because we've done some scoping work in the past. Um, and whilst I think there were some concerns at the start that, while, that there were a number of people within DART headquarters that didn't want to move, the, the, the um, further work that we've done now has been it's generated quite an overwhelming response with over 4,000 staff who have registered an interest in wanting to seek one of these posts. That's far more um, people are wanting to apply than the posts that we have. However, I think that shows very clearly that there is a need for a change in the public sector. It shows very clearly that there's a need for individuals who, who want to find a better work-life balance and who want to find a job closer to home. So in, in terms of in Ballykelly alone, we've had over 1,500 people who, who wanted to apply to go there. Cookstown, over 1,000. Downpatrick, almost 1,000. Enniskillen, 435. So that, to me, shows a significant appetite for posts outside of Belfast. Detailed analysis is now currently underway, and that will determine um, the grade matches between those who have expressed an interest in DARD and the positions that we have for each location. But I am very enthused by the numbers of, of um, staff that have decided that they want to um, work in a different location and work out of the greater Belfast area. That's very positive. And it clearly, um, I think, shows again that there is a need for this change across all departments. I call Paul Gervin. Uh, that a lot of issues associated with the department are going for growth. Um, what mechanism is in place to ensure that those uh, young people are encouraged into farms in Northern Ireland? Or is somewhere around in, in um, I think it's early 60s. So that's something that obviously has to change. I think one of the things that we can be um, encouraged by is the fact that we've had so many people who um, feel they're eligible for the Young Farmer Scheme under the new current Common Agricultural Policy. So that shows that we have um, quite a significant number of people who are actually head of holding, who are taking over farms. And that's something that we have never seen that age profile before. So we now have supports in place. We put the maximum amount of support we can put in place for um, a top-up for people's single farm payment for the young farmer. And I think that obviously has 
um, played a factor in terms of um, maybe it's time for some people to move aside and let, and let the younger people in the family come, come onto the farm. So um, I, I'm quite enthused by that. Order,